get by It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the same like right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And Tucker, I always like to mention past episodes that people should check out. Um, John Rulin, we were just talking about John Rulin um, of Giftology. John's just an amazing human being. Um, and, and I was thinking of like different authors I respect and like, um, and you'll see why that conversation is relevant before I introduce Tucker Max uh, from Scribe Media. But um, I've read and listened to, I probably listen to three to six books per week on Audible. I do listen to them on multiple times speed so I can get through them. But, but like David Goggins book, the Who Not How book, which is part of the Scribe Media family, John mm-hmm. Rulin. I mean, I could probably list over 70 books that I probably listened to. Um, so check out past episodes. Um, John Rulin is, is an amazing one. Um, and you know, there, there's just so many good ones. I just uh, released one with the founder of Kettle Chips and Kona Brewery and just comes from humble. I love hearing the, you know, just had to toil and work and it just takes a lot of grit. And we see the journey on the other side when they're successful, but like all the blood, sweat and tears that went into building that company and the, the points where it could have all crumbled around him and he just kept going. So those are the real stories that we see the overnight success after like 30 years, you know? So I love hearing those. So listen to that in, in other episodes. And before I introduce Tucker Max, um, this episode is brought to you by Rise 25. Uh, Rise 25, we help businesses connect to their Dream 100 relationships by giving to them. We help them do that by running your podcast. And, you know, Tucker, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I always want to give to my relationships. And I found no better way personally um, over the past 10 years than having the people and the companies I admire on my podcast. And, and you do the same thing with books, which it's not just about content. It's not just about relationships. It's also about helping people leave a legacy because it continues on past this thing. And your kids will watch stuff that you do, your grandkids, your great grandkids, this stuff, whether it's a book, a podcast, it will continue the legacy of your thought leadership and knowledge, anyone who does it, right? So. Um, if you have questions about podcasting, go to rise25.com, learn more. I've been doing it for over a decade. Um, today's guest is Tucker Max. I'm really excited. Um, I, I was looking back, Tucker, I was like, I can't believe I've not had Tucker on the podcast over this amount of time. And we've been connecting in so many different ways, even through Mixergy. Um, you know, if you don't know Tucker, he's evolved from writing a New York Times bestselling nonfiction um, in his 20s. So if you can imagine what 20s are like for maybe a male who likes women. Um, that's, I actually never read the books, Tucker. And I know people who read all of your blog posts before they were books and followed all of your work um, into New York Times bestseller. And he sold millions of copies. And now he's turned from that, escapades in his 20s to family man, founder of Scribe Media. Um, Scribe Media is a professional public, you know, publishing services company. And I describe it to people, Tucker, is they help you unlock your knowledge and help you produce something you're really proud of in the form of a book, which again, it's entrepreneurs, executive experts, and they help you write, publish, and market your book. Um, and it's not just your book, as you say, it's, it's a legacy piece. So yeah. Tucker, thanks for joining me. Of course, man. Thanks for having me. What else did I not, what else should people know about Scribe Media? I mean, I don't, so I'm one of those, like, I don't like to talk about what we do because it seems obnoxious, right? Like, oh, let me tell you all but about people myself. are like, interested. No one care. What I'll tell you what they're interested in. They're interested in themselves and how we can help them, right? And so here's what I would tell you about, or your listeners about Scribe. If you've ever wanted to write a book, then we have absolutely the best place to start. It's called scribebookschool.com, right? So literally type that in, scribebookschool.com. It'll take you what, what we did, uh, it, you know, when the pandemic hit last year, um, uh, I basically got online for a week because when everyone was home in like April, right? I was like, listen, if you've ever wanted to write a book, now's the time and I'm going to teach you exactly how. And I spent a week online for probably like six hours a day teaching our exact process, like literally the exact things that we do with our authors. Every Didn't leave anything out. 
didn't, you know, keep the secret sauce or any of that nonsense. And then that ended up becoming um, like this amazing video course. And so we thought for a second, oh, we could sell that. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm in hell with that because we have a high end service firm, right? And so if we're selling a course, it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't work. So we just decided to put it up for free. Like there's a ton of people who sell courses on how to write and publish books and none of them, uh, bless their hearts, they're trying, but none of them know what the hell they're talking about. Um, and I say that almost without exception because the type of people who really know how to do this don't make video courses about it. And just because of the way it worked, we did. And so we decided to put it up for free. And so it's uh, scribebookschool.com, start there, right? Now, what if you don't have a lot of money or you can't afford to invest a lot of money in your book, everything there's free. Every piece of information you need is there for free. Now, if you if you're successful and you realize, oh, a book might actually help me in my career or it's a marketing expense for me, it'll promote me, it'll promote my business. I can actually uh, and, you know, I can devote some resources to this and I don't have a lot of time to do this because it is a large investment of time to do a book. Right. Anyone who's like, oh, you can write a book in a weekend is a clown selling you BS. Do not listen to them. You can write a book in a weekend and it will be off and it will make you look bad. Right. Like all the people who sell write a book in a weekend courses all look bad. Right. Um, because that's like, you know, you can build a house in a weekend. It's just going to be a lean to and it'll be awful and it'll fall down. Same thing with a book. So um, if, you, if you're like, you know, I, like I need to invest money in this or I have money to invest in this and, and I need, um, uh, I want to buy my time or I want to get expert help. So that's what Scribe does. Uh, we have a whole company. We help people write and publish books, right? So we're a service firm, not a traditional publisher, right? So you don't have to pitch us on any nonsense. You come in, you need help. We can pick you up almost at any point where you are. So most people who come in pay 40,000 and we take them from their idea all the way through to publish the book and marketing, right? So we help them, you know, position it, conceptual, conceptualize. What am I even gonna write about? Who's gonna care about it, right? How's it gonna help me? The crucial questions you have to answer before you spend any time writing a book, we literally walk you, I mean, that's. The, we don't even do sales calls. We basically do exploration calls. And those are the calls we actually start with on the first call before even paying us money. We got to know if you have a book in you, if it's worth your time, should you invest money in this, right? So we start there. And then we take you through the whole process. Or you can write the book yourself and we can do publishing and marketing. Or you can say, you know what? Like, um, I want to write it, but I want you guys to coach me along the way. We can do coaching. We can do it sort of more of a ghostwriting process where we interview you and get it all out of you and you're just on the phone, but it's all your ideas, your words, your, your, you know, your process or your, your, like your ideas and your words, your voice, even, right? Like we're, we're actually really good. I can't tell you how many times people have been like, hold on, you worked on that book and that book. Those books are totally different. I'm like, right. Because our job is to bring out the voice of the author, not our voice, right? Um, so basically, if you want help writing uh, uh, and publishing and marketing a great book, where are the place you go? Tucker, out of that process, I'm sure you discovered sometimes when you teach something, you learn even more or uncover even more that you already know. I'm wondering from when you were teaching the Scribe Book School process, what's an important piece of that process that maybe people going through it you think this is super important and people underestimate the importance of that portion in the process of writing a book. Man, there are so many. Um, let me stick with the two biggest. So the, the biggest, the number one most important thing is the thing I already talked about. It's, it's called position, right? Which is essentially understanding the relationship between three questions. What are you going to get out of your book? Like, why are you writing it? And not a lot of people are like, oh, I just want to help people. And I'm like, okay, cool. So then don't put your name on it and, don't, and, and uh, uh, write it anonymously. They're like, well, hold on. I'm like, okay, it's okay to want something for yourself from a book. That's not selfish, right? It, and even if it is selfish, you get to get things from your work. You know, it, it, it can help you and other people. And so um, really understanding what do you want to get from your book? Is it money? Is it uh, um, is it a notoriety? Is it prestige? 
Is it visibility? Is it legacy? These are all great things. Nothing wrong with any of them. Um, but you need to, to, to really understand what you're looking for. Because if what you want is visibility, um, uh, that's a different book than if you're going to write a book for legacy. Probably a different book, right? Uh, and by the way, most people have multiple books in them. So it, like, don't try and cram everything in the mm-hmm. book. Anyway, so first question is, what do you want? Second question is, who do you need to write a book for to get that, right? So like, Jeremy, if you're like, you know what, Tucker, I want to write a book that's going to get me clients for Rise25 for my podcasting company. Cool, great. So then we would talk about, okay, who are your clients, right? Who do you need this book to get in front of uh, in order for you to get clients? And then you would tell me a profile. Well, they're like this, right? They're, I'm just going to make something up. They're entrepreneurs who have businesses, who um, love talking and, and maybe have thought about a podcast and a podcast could absolutely help them in their business. And the way it'll help them is because either they're talking about what they do to people who are interested, like sharing their knowledge, like a, let's say um, a mortgage broker who's teaching people how to buy houses right? Like that might be an interesting podcast or they use the podcast to interview prospective clients, but not like I'm pitching you, but more like I want to, I'm going to talk to all the big people in this field and and get their knowledge and wisdom. Right. Okay. Great. Awesome. I know exactly who you're talking about because those are our clients too. Uh, So that's your audience. So number one is what do you want? Number two is what's your audience? So let's stick with you because that's an easy one. You want more clients for Rise 25? Your audience are entrepreneurs who are looking for clients, right? And, and like and want like to talk, right? And like to you know entertain people. Um, third question: How do you reach those people? Right? What do you have to say that matters to those people? Why are they going to care? Now, if in your case the answer is obvious, you can teach them how to position a podcast, how to set up a podcast, how to run a pod, record a great podcast how to run it, how to promote it, everything about podcasts you know. You are to podcast what I am to, right? And so like that's, if I'm a business owner and I am, and I want to start a podcast and actually I do, which is why I'm here right now because we had a different call about that, right? Um, then I'm very interested in what you have to say because what you have to say is getting me something I want, right? I want to know about podcasts. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I, I, this is actually kind of what I did, what I'm doing. I'm going to go read, if I think, okay, I'm thinking about podcasts. I've heard this. A lot of people have them. I think it might help my, help me in my business, but I'm not sure how. I don't want a big podcast. Like I can't be Tim Ferriss or Joe Rogan, but like, uh, you know, I, I'm just confused. I don't know where to start. How do I think about this? It seems overwhelming. Do I have to buy a thousand dollar microphone? I'm like, oh, Jeremy knows. And so I'll read your book and be like, man, I'm going to do one of two things. I'm going to read it and say, this guy's brilliant. I can just do all this myself, right? I'm not going to though, because I have a lot more money than I have time. And so I'm going to read your book and say, fuck it. I'm just going to hire this guy. Man. <laughs> this guy knows his stuff. And look like, and then I look at your site and I'm like, oh, he only charges that? Oh, I'm in. Let's go. Done. So that's the basic reason you're going to write a nonfiction book. Right. So our company only does nonfiction and memoir, which some people don't think of nonfiction for some reason. We don't do fiction. Fiction's an entirely different animal. They're complete it's a completely different process uh, to think about it. But that's the number one thing is positioning, right? What do you want? Who do you have to reach? Uh, why are they gonna care? Does that make sense? You know what? I think that's instructive, Tucker, for any business. It does, you know, that's why I want to hear about your book process, because it's the way any business should think about. Knowing your audience, how do you exactly. reach your audience? Positioning it, it, makes sense it, it, in all exa- fields. Exactly. <laughs> it's what you, know, you do with your podcast clients. I bet you do the exact same process or something very similar, right? You have to, it, yes, yes. Um, because, and that's why I want you to go through the book process because it is a process of positioning and marketing and thinking through your business. So I, I don't care if you're, in my opinion, I don't care if you are obviously thinking of writing a book, you could check out scribe school, bookschool.com. But I think any business owner, in my opinion, would probably, it would be very valuable for anyone to go through that exercise, those exercises. It's not just about writing a book. I mean, that's yep. only the end product of what everything, what everything, what happens, right? Yep. Yeah. Well, so that's why you want though, to deal with experts in each media field, because <laughs> 
uh, even though positioning as a general thing is important, how you position in podcasts is not the same as how you position in book books. Although they're similar, it's not like they're just you know it's not French versus Chinese. They're they're similar enough, but there's some intricacies that if you're not deep in that field, you might get a little bit confused or lost by. You know, so that's why that's why even if I was doing a podcast, I'd still talk to you because I'm like, okay, Jeremy's going to think of that one thing that I'm not going to see, even though I know positioning very well. You know, what are the common reasons? I know people come in thinking I just want to help people. But when you dig deeper, you find kind of those those the real reason. What are some of the common reasons that you find people do want to do a book? So let me be good. When someone says I want to help people, it's not that they don't want to help people. They aren't lying about that. It's just that a lot of people think that they're not allowed to want something from a book or from something else, right? That like, they have to say, I'm only here to help people. Um, and, and that selfishness, and I mean that in a benevolent, good, good way, right? Totally. Or yeah. self, let's use a different word, self-care. I think when you're doing any project, an important part of self-care is understanding what's in it for you. Now, you also have to, like, if you dig deeper into our process, I, I went over it quick. We, we have two questions. Like, the first qu Uber question is, why are you writing a book? But it's two different questions. What are you going to get for it, for yourself only? Then the other question is, what's your reader going to get from your book? Both are super important. They're never the same thing. Ever. I, like, you aren't going to get podcast knowledge from your book, right? You already have it. That's why you're writing the book. I'm going to get podcast knowledge from your book, right? So we are never getting the same thing from a book. Me as your reader and you as the author, ever, not once. Like, if you read my books, you would laugh a lot. I didn't, I mean, I laughed maybe when I did it or maybe the first time. <laughs> I'm not getting laughter from writing my book, right? Like, it's not, that's not how it works. It's an exchange, you're giving me your knowledge, I'm giving you my money, right? And it's a fair exchange and we're both better off because you get 15 bucks you wouldn't have had, I get a bunch of knowledge I wouldn't have had. We both value them higher than, than, uh, than, than what we're paying. Well, right? you have a book, Tucker, on how to write a book, right? Yes, yes, it is. So it, it's funny, like that's basically what I did is I got on, on, the, on the video and I taught, uh, it was actually a webinar and I taught a whole book. Um, so it, 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 we tell most of our authors to write short books because for a lot of reasons, uh, um, I, we wrote a 500 page book on how to write a book. <laughs> we didn't follow our own advice. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you why, because like, uh, if you really want to do it right, it's a shitload of knowledge. It really is, man. There's just no way around this. And so we decided we weren't going to do the high level skip over the surface of writing a book. We were going to tell you how to do everything and do it right. So both the course, Scribe Book School, and the book are serious deep dives. Because what I wanted, my intent was if someone, someone like me, when I first started writing, I was like 27, I had no money, and I didn't know anything about writing. I couldn't afford even, I'm not even sure I could afford to apply to my company to work, and it's free. <laughs> and so like, like. Because uh, I'm not sure I even had a computer. In fact, I didn't have a computer when I started writing. I had to use my friend's computer. This is, you know, I'm 45 now. So this is 18 years ago. So different thing. But like, um, so uh, uh, I wanted something that was completely comprehensive. And for, so no one would, uh, with any amount of money or anywhere in the world, would say they didn't know what to do. Right? You will always know what to do with Scribe Book School. Uh, it, it, it would, it, that's, so that's why I wanted to go that deep. Most people shouldn't go that deep, not because you're trying to hold your knowledge back, but just because like the, uh, it, most people don't need that depth. Right. And that's actually what happens with us is people start reading and they're like, God, this is actually really complex. And they're right. I see it. I understand all this. It's super complex. I'm just going to hire them. Probably 20% of our clients who pay us anywhere from 40 to 100 grand, read the book first. <laughs> Seriously, which is actually blew me away. It's like, man, like I knew the book would work and it would be uh, important. And it has been. I didn't realize that many would read the book, but they do. And that's, that's why a lot of anyone who ever tells you, just write a book. It doesn't matter what's in it. No one will read it. Is screwing you. 
they are wrong because you're let's think about that let's say only 20 percent of the people who bought um our book read it or even 10 percent. those are the buyers the buyers are the reader and so if you aren't impressing the people who are trying to give you money then you will be out of business or you're at least limiting your sale yeah and the people who care will take the time to read it research it and and um i there there's several when i did research tucker i was like i like to pull out what I feel like are these turning points and have you discuss some of these turning points. So I want to talk one, about one of those turning points, but before we talk about, because it was a dinner conversation, I think it was a dinner conversation with a woman who you started lecturing on, yes. on this, but I wanted you to talk about that. But, but um, I'm curious, you said that people have multiple books in them. And yes. I don't know if you're allowed to talk about this or say this, but who are some of the authors who have published maybe the most amount of books with Scribe Media? Yeah. I mean, if you, we, I don't think we've published any, no, we've published like one or two anonymous books and they weren't famous people. Right. So, um, they're like, Oh, I have like three books. I have four books. I have five books with scribe me. Are there, who are the people Cameron, that have Cameron come back Harold, multiple times? Yeah. Is Cameron Harold been on rice 25? I've yes. Had, right? uh, yeah, yeah. He's been, uh, yeah. Can, he has three books. I've so. listened to all of his books. Yeah. So we did, uh, meetings, meetings suck, suck. Yeah. Vivid vision and free PR. Um, we did those three. Ooh. Man, we've got a, we've got a mortgage broker in Canada. What's his name? Dustin Woodhouse, I think, who's done three or four books with us. Um, we've got a bunch who've done two, like really, like uh, maybe a dozen or more, two two or three dozen. Uh, I I don't think anyone's done more than three. I mean, we've only been around six years, so it'd be tough to have done <laughs> more than three. <laughs> like that's you'd have to be a machine, man. Um, yeah, yeah the Kierman Herald, I mean, <clears throat> just to talk about your comment on you want it to be really good. I've had probably at least six people on my podcast that have said they've bought Cameron Herald's meetings suck for all of their friends, like in yeah, all right. of their executives in their company. So they're like, yeah. hey, and they'll buy like 20 copies and distribute it to every leadership person in their company. You know, yeah. no, because Cameron's books are. Because they're awesome. He designed them so so that they, they you know they're fifteen to twenty five thousand words. They're really short, and they're designed to be, be able to re be read on a cross country flight and to absolutely nail a very specific, very painful business process. You know, so meetings. But it's a it, once you have them right, you're fine. If you don't have them right, it screws your whole company up. It's millions of dollars lost, right? Um, vivid vision, which is basically like a, like a mission statement, corporate alignment, right? Huge problem if you don't have it dealt with. P free PR. How do you get attention? <laughs> right? Marketing. There's no one needs less marketing. You know, the, the inception of the company I find interesting. Um, take me back to that dinner with the woman um, and what she asked you and what you said. Yeah, Melissa Gonzalez. Uh, she basically, we were at an entrepreneur dinner and she told me, she's like, listen, for a decade, people have been asking me to write a book about what I do. I tried. It was a pain in the ass. I didn't have time. I've got kids in this and a, and a business, right? And you know, I looked at traditional publishing. It was painful and awful. It just none of that makes sense. It's a dumb process. And I'm like, yeah, it is kind of. Um, and so she's like, well, how do I do it then? How do I get this book out of my head without having to go through the normal process? And I kind of looked at her and I'm like, hold on a minute. Are you asking me how to write a book without writing it? And she's like, yeah. And so. I give her, I, I hate elitist snob writers. I hate them, but man, I acted like one then. I, I started giving her my most elitist snobby writer answer, which boiled down to uh, you need to learn how to write a book, right? That the only way to write it is to do the work. And I said, you know, saying stuff like everyone wants to be a star, no one wants to put in the work and like all of that nonsense, right? I basically was working. And she, <laughs> she like, right. I was like, you're, you're too lazy. You you don't want it. You got to want it more. Like all those bad nonsense. And, um, she looked at me, man, I'll never forget the look on her face, dude. And she rolled her eyes out of her skull and she goes, Tucker, this is an entrepreneur dinner. <laughs> Are you an entrepreneur? I'm like, yeah, of course. She's like, no, nah, I don't think so. Because a real entrepreneur would help me solve my problem. It wouldn't lecture me about hard work. And I was like, man, Bafangu. Like, I, I was so mad at her. But I couldn't actually get mad at her because she was right. She was 100% right. I was shaming 
her because she wasn't fitting into my idea as a writer as opposed to thinking, okay, is there another way to solve this problem? And so I became obsessed with the issue because, you know, when someone calls you out and they're right, then it's like, oh, you can't get past it. At least I can't. And so it took me about two months because I'm slow. And then I realized, oh, this is a solved problem. Like scribes have existed for 2000 years. Socrates didn't write a word down. Plato did, right? Jesus didn't write a word down. The apostles did. Buddha didn't write a word down. Malcolm X didn't write a word down. Um, Marco Polo didn't. Julius Caesar did. We go down the list. Uh, most of the great minds, or a huge number of the great minds of Western and Eastern civilization, had people write their stuff down for them. It's a skill, like being a lawyer. Having the ideas is very hard. Accumulating the knowledge, turning into wisdom, that's very difficult. Any, anyone with the right skills can write it down into a book. And so uh, now it's important to note, like she, she, she didn't want a ghostwriter. It was like, oh, just get a ghostwriter. Ghostwriting the way it's done right now is, is someone writes their version of your ideas and then you pay them to put your name on it. We didn't want to do that. We wanted this to be her ideas in her words and her voice, right? Everything her. And so um, I was like, okay, yeah, let me just make a modern scribe process. And so like, I kind of wrote out all the steps on a whiteboard and I realized I only needed her for about 40% of the book, which is an important 40%, the content, right? But it's like the rest is essentially subbing it out to very skilled people in a discrete process. And it worked. And uh, the funny thing is, man, Jeremy, I'm such a bad entrepreneur. We finished it, the book came out, it was amazing. She loved it. And she's like, uh, uh, I forget what I charged her. It was basically a trivial amount just because it was like a project. Like I had to, to, to solve my bruised ego. And she's like, what, what should I tell my friends you charge? I'm like, charge for what? <laughs> she's like, for writing books. And I'm like, why would you tell them that? <laughs> she's like, because they're all asking me how I did this and I'll refer them to you. I'm like, mm. I don't want, no, I'm not doing this for the rest of your friends. Like what, what am I, some work for hire? first <laughs> i'm such a dummy and so she but she's like okay i'm just gonna tell them whatever and like uh they started coming to me and then zach who's my co-founder who you know really well he was working with me on another project and i'm like hey dude if we split the money can i just give these people to you i, I don't want to do this and i told them my exact process and zach's a great writer he's like oh totally and after about two months he's like you know we've done a quarter million sales <laughs> He's like, maybe we have a business. And I'm like, ah, oh, maybe we do. <laughs> and so how did you meet Zach? And what's Zach's background? Man, I, I don't even remember how we met. He emailed me about something and then like I gave him a project to work on and then he killed it. And it was like, he's like, he, he was one of those, I think it was like 24 when I met him. Yeah, because he's 30 now. And he was like one of those people where I'm like, oh, this dude's a star. He just hasn't found his place yet. And um, it was just really honestly total luck that that came together with him uh he hadn't really done anything before that truly but like the dude has grown into an absolute rock star like he's my company right now is so we, we didn't take any outside money no vc no investors we have three owners me him and my ceo is also a star javon mccormick um absolute like it, it's funny when we started i was the only one that was known i was the one that everyone paid attention to i was the star and now a good argument could be made that I'm the least important of the three. <laughs> and I'm, I'm totally serious, man. Like, and I'll bet you in the history is written, at least of Scribe, I, like Javon and Zach are going to be more important to it than I will be. I want to go into the, the roles a little bit um, because we were talking before, you know, Zach is building this, this is my role. And then I know you wrote a long post, which I think is, is very instructive around why you fired yourself as CEO. Yeah. So I wanted to start there um, because there was a, a, you know, kind of another turning point where you realized you needed to take it to the next level. And you also put your ego aside and realized that wasn't you. Yeah. Um, so why, so like when you were coming to that for yourself, um, was it more of like a natural evolution progression of you thinking about it or was it to hit you one day of the goals you wanted to accomplish where you wanted to see the company and that wasn't you it, it, it was it was a little bit of both um so we got to about a million and a half two million in sales and the wheel started coming off like once we kind of 
like got past eight or 10 people, like the, the amount of stuff you can keep in your head, right? Or I can keep in my head uh, and Zach and I at least. And th- once we got past that point, then the wheel started coming off because anyone who's grown a business will know uh, starting a business and scaling a business are so fundamentally different things that like, it's like the difference between fiction and nonfiction. Like people think they're similar because both of them get printed on dead trees and they are, they're so fundamentally different. It's, there's really no one that overlaps between the two, basically. Um, uh, and I don't mean that literally, but basically, right? Because they're that different. So movies and TV shows, same, very similar in a lot of ways. Uh, but um, starting and scaling company are completely different skill sets. And um, so Javon was a client of ours doing a book with us. And I got him to start coaching me on how to be a CEO. And I realized real quick that one, he was awesome at that. And two, I didn't want to do it. It sucks. <laughs> I didn't want to scale a business, man. But like, you know, like I was young, a lot younger then. That's like five years ago. And I, like, there's a lot of ego tied up in being the CEO and all that nonsense. And so I convinced him to join our company. And he told me, he's like, I'll come on as COO and president. And then I thought about that for a second, but I'm like, no, we can't do that because that's not true. Like it, if you were here, you would be the CEO in all but name. And I, I don't live lies. I just won't do it. And so let's just, I'm going to step aside. But like I was resistant, you know, like, I, and then I, the, the thing that really tripped it for me is when I asked myself, well, why am I doing this? Is it for me? Because then I'll stay CEO. Or is it for the mission and the company? And then I'm like, no, it's for the mission. Okay, well, then I got to get out of his way because that dude's going to kick ass at this company. And I, yeah, I got a big role to, to play and I, I'm still very important to the company. But my important import is not in learning how to scale it, different skill. And so he became CEO and now we've done 50 million in sales um, since he joined. And we're like a 70 person full-time team, 250, 300 freelance. We're like, we're a huge company, 800 books published, another 1,100 in process. We're a big company now. Tucker, talk about, you know, because he was doing something else. And you were thinking of, in your mind, I can't even afford you, right? So talk yeah. about how you got him aboard, essentially, on the mission. He, he was a president of a software company. Um, he, he wasn't the founder. And the founder wouldn't give him equity, uh, but was paying him a high salary. I think it was almost a million dollars a year. It was like a lot. <laughs> like we weren't even in the universe, <clears throat> excuse me, of, of that salary. And so, man, it was, it was real simple. I'm like, do you want, I basically, it, it's just storytelling, right? It was understanding what he wanted and seeing it aligned with what we were, we were going, right? So it's like, I didn't, you know, manipulate him. It was like, okay, what he wants is in the same direction as we're already going. And so then I just painted a picture for him, man. I'm like, look, the company you're at is fine, whatever, but the dude's not going to give you ownership, which is bullshit because he built that company. Like that company was, it was very small when he got there and he 10 x it. And uh, I'm like, so if you came over here, I'll, I'll make you an owner. Like you'll earn equity a lot. I said, eventually you can have as much as I, like I'll, I'll pull you even with me, which he's already done, right? Um, but more importantly, anywhere else you go to work for someone, you're going to be their person, right? You're working for them. Like here, you're working with us and you're leading. And he was a dude that like, I don't want to say he wanted to be famous, but he wanted to be recognized for what he had done. And I'm like, look, man, and he was a baller. He deserves it, right? I'm like, I can absolutely help you get that. Like, I think you're a star. I told him, I'm like, you are a star. The world just doesn't know yet. I can make sure the world knows. That's all it is, is just putting your stuff out. It's not, I didn't say, oh, I can turn you into a star. It's like, no, like we're doing, a, a, he loved our mission, what we did, all that. I'm like, you can not just join this mission, you can lead this mission and you can get credit for what you're doing in front of the world and you can own your share of it. Um, and he was, that's, that's the only way you sell stars, man, is you don't sell them. Like you paint the picture for what they can get. And if it aligns with what they want, they come. 
Yeah. And a big piece is someone wants to, as they're building it, they want to have ownership in it as well. Of course. Of course. I mean, like that, that's, it, it, I don't, it would be offensive to my soul if that man did not own at least as much as I did in this company. He's, we're, we weren't getting to, we might not have gotten to 5 million without him. We definitely weren't getting to 50. Yeah. Like we we're gonna be a, we were gonna be a small like and I don't mean this disparagingly we were gonna be a small lifestyle company we we probably would have gotten to about three to five million in sales uh, with a very small team and we never would have grown above that because I don't know how to scale a company and I wasn't super interested in learning so that's what we would have been. What did you observe, Tucker? With I love to hear um, how the CEO what what he implemented. And then I would love to hear kind of Zach's what Zach's building and what your, your role is now. So with the CEO, what did you, what did he come in and, and implement um, that? <laughs> Besides everything. everything. Like, no, I mean, seriously, dude, like, you know, we were, we were basically running our accounting out of a shoebox, not literally, of course, like we were on zero and all that, but like we didn't have sophisticated financials. Like we had a basic P and L. Um, we didn't have serious controls, you know, now we have a diet, we have financials in the 50 to hundred million dollar company, like, like the way that they're set up. Right. Uh, no, I mean, 50 to hundred million a year in top line where our financials are at that level, maybe even above. Um, and then, uh, a whole operations back end. Like we knew, you know, the only thing we knew how to do, Jeremy, we knew how to do two things. We knew how to write books. Like we were badass in our process. And I knew how to talk about it and get attention. And that's the only thing we knew how to do. He has, along with the people that he hired, who are, we have an awesome executive team, he has created a scalable process for writing books that is still deeply creative and, and respectful and nurturing of the individual going through it. That's so fucking hard, man. That's like, I've lived through it, right? It, it is almost inconceivably difficult what we have pulled off as a company and he led. No one's ever done this. Like no one has ever done this, even close. I know every company that in the book space, right? I'm not saying other creative processes that haven't been scaled. That's silly. In the book space, no one's come even close um, at all to, to both the scale and the quality and the customer service, man. Like our NPS score now is through the roof. And dude, I can't tell you, you want a, you want a disaster of a customer service company, go get people to pay you a lot of money to write a book. And then how, like, cause dude, there's so many expectations with that. And so many emotional, so much emotional involvement and ties. It is one of the highest, hardest bars, which I didn't understand going in at all. Because I'm just looking at it like, it's easy for me to write a book because I know how to write a book. But like for people who don't know how to write a book and this is their first book, this isn't writing a book, man. This is like having a kid or something, right? It really is. Or like getting married or uh, picking out a grave plot or a house. This is a deeply emotional process. And which I did, of course it was for me like that too when I wrote my first book, but that was 15 years ago. I've forgotten it, right? And so we have this astoundingly a uh, high touch, high end customer service company for a deeply emotional process. And it, it's amazing. It works. <laughs> He's led that whole thing, man. I probably, I, if we're dividing up percentages, I'm responsible for about 5% of that. And he and the executive team are responsible for, Zach and I are responsible for maybe 10. He and the executive team are responsible for the other 90. So CEO role, what is Zach working on? In, in so, yeah. So right now we've kind of divided up. Um, uh, so he, it's funny. Scribe, Javon runs, exec team runs. Zach and I aren't in the meetings anymore. Like the exec meeting. We don't even waste our, because we basically are just getting in the way now. Zach has d dove deep into programming and AI. And so he's essentially long-term building that skill set. And I think we're going to, there's a lot of things we can do in that space. I don't know what we're going to do, 
but we have a lot of space. I mean, that's just, that is one of the growth spaces in the world. And he's a legitimately a genius. And so he's picked that up fast and he's gotten really good. And, and we've got multiple ways that we're going to grow there. I'm not sure what. I have stayed in my lane. We're about to launch. Um, I've actually not talked about this anywhere. I'll, I'll break it on your show. For real. This is genuinely news, right? And not like it's going to be front page of the Wall Street Journal, but it is actual news. We are launching a traditional publisher. So our model, Scribe is fee-for-service, right? It is what we call professional publishing, but basically high-end self-publishing, right? So you want to self-publish, you want to own all your rights, you want to control the creative process, but you don't want to deal with the work, you pay us, right? Traditional publishers, you pitch them, they give you an advance, and they own, they have creative control, uh, and then they own the back end, and you get a royalty. We're actually going to launch a traditional publisher. But we're going to launch a very, it's going to look and feel very different. It's going to be a 21st century traditional publisher with the same, the same basic model, right? Um, we have not launched it yet. I'm not even, gonna, I can't tell you the name. Well, we actually are not locked in on the name. We're, we're basically are, but I, like it could be one of two things. So I don't want to say it's this, and the site's not up yet. So, I, but we're launching a traditional publisher. Uh, what day is it? April 14th. Um, by June 1st is latest, the site will be up. Maybe May 1st. So talk about David Goggins for a second, because he was mm -hmm. considering traditional, right? Versus- yep. He got an offer. Three, yeah. He got $300,000 offer from Harper One, I think. Um, he turned them down because he decided he wanted to create, have full creative control, own his rights, um, uh, and kind of control everything. And we, we're the only option for high-end publishing. I mean, there's plenty of little crappy self-publishing companies mm -hmm. that do like dingy little work for cheap. If you want to do really high-end professional self-publishing, we're really the only option. Uh, that's not true. There's another company called Page Two that's pretty solid. They're good. They've done a few books that are actually really good. So there's two options, but like we're the, we're the big one and they're like a smaller boutique firm that does excellent work as well. Um, and so he picked us and um, I mean, the rest is history, man. He wrote like, you know, we helped them uh, with, uh, you know, writing and editing uh, Can't Hurt Me. And then we did all the design, all the publishing. So like, like his cover, which is one of the best book covers I've ever seen, our creative director did. She's an amazing designer, by the way. She's like world class. And then uh, we did the marketing, which I will admit, marketing David Goggins was not hard. <laughs> it's basically picking the places we're going to go and telling them we're coming on. So it's not like, I don't want to be like, oh, we're marketing. Gee. He was David Goggins when he <laughs> showed up. You know? I mean, he was nowhere near as famous as he is now, but he was, you know, he'd been on Rogan. He was well known. So it was not hard. Um, you know, he had the hot biggest impact theory by far. He had like, you know, a top, a top 20 Rogan episode. So it was pretty easy to get, get attention for him. Um, I can tell you his numbers because he just told me I'm allowed to talk about this. He, uh, he sold right now about 2.5 roughly 2.5 million copies of his book. So in about a year and a half. Yeah. Amazing. Or is it two and a half years? Year and a half. Yeah, it's a great book. I listened to it. Um, talk about the, the founder of Chipotle and, yes. and his story Monty. for a second. Yeah, so uh, his name is Monty Moran. Um, he did a book called, which is a great title, Love is Free, Guac is Extra. Um, he built, <laughs> he's the founder of Chipotle. And so he did a book with us, a uh, super nice guy. He's a perfect example. I hope Monty doesn't mind me talking about this. He's a perfect example of why high-end um, scaled self-publishing or high-end scaled, like let's call it, you know, ghostwriting, uh, scribing doesn't exist except before us because it's so hard to do, right? Like Monty had so many fears around his book and so many concerns and worries. I mean, justifiable. It's not, he's not like some weirdo. Uh, every first time author is afraid. That's just the way I was. He was less afraid than I was. So it's not like he said, but like he had a lot of uh, concerns and it was a big emotional moment for him. It is sort of like birthing a baby, except it's not another human, it's yourself, right? And so um, it took a long time, yeah, for him to really be comfortable with his book and be comfortable with what he was saying and, and, and or how it was being presented and stuff like that. And the book ended up fantastic, man. It's really good. I think he's really proud of it. Um, yeah. So like, he's a really good, it's funny, like, and he, uh, uh, he, uh, he's a great example of someone who like, 
he was pretty freaked out when it was about to come out. And like, it's so funny. You talk to him now. He's like, oh yeah, this book's amazing. You guys were great. I'm so happy with everything. Everything couldn't have been smoother. And I'm like, Monty. <laughs> hold on a minute buddy which is like it's funny when i talk to my wife you know like we have three kids right and like she'll be like she'll be talking to some other woman who's like you know pregnant with the first kid she's like oh it's amazing the birth is beautiful you know like uh, you love it and then i'm like wait a minute i was there for all three because we did home birth so i was there for the whole time i'm like I remember things a little differently. And she's like, and she'll look at me and she's like, yeah, you're right. Like, I, I, I have a memory of the pain. It just doesn't, like, it's like, it doesn't resonate with me anymore. Books are the same way. You will, I always tell our, our, our authors, you're going to hate your book when you're editing it. You're going to be afraid of your book right before it comes out. And you will forget all of that six months later. And you'll have nothing but love for your book. I love it. Um, there's so much more to, to cover, but um, one last question, Tucker. And before I ask it, everyone go to scribemedia.com um, and, and go to scribebookschool.com and check out more. I mean, there's other stuff on there. Your, your journey has been pretty amazing. Um, and there, there's other information on the internet. So I kind of wanted to talk about Scribe, but going, you know, uh, going from raised in Kentucky to University of Chicago to Duke Law School to best selling you know, uh, book uh, author, millions of millions of copies describe media. Um, I wanted to just talk about something and I was watching your interview is a good interview with um, Tom Bilyeu. And um, one of the things you talked about, which was interesting, which is about um, kids. And what like, I think he asked you a question and you said, you know, this is going to sound like a trite answer. Um, right. But I wanted to have you talk a little bit about how kids, your kids have changed you um, and what you've learned from, from having kids. How my kids have changed, man. I mean, we could have done the whole episode on this. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's not a small question. Um, that's like, tell me your thoughts on life. On <laughs> All right. What's if I had to give one? Uh, I just I what, what one, comes to mind recently because I know we were talking about yeah. And there's another good episode where you talked about psychedelics and things like that, and um, how you want to raise your kids. And I thought it was yeah. interesting. So here's what kids have meant to me. Like if I were to sum it up to one thing, right? I'd rather talk about this for an hour. But if I if you're like, no, you got two minutes. What are you going to say? I would say kids, um, my experience with kids are that kids are a mirror, right? So whatever it is you are, however it is you show up, you're going to see it in them. And then how you respond to that defines both what kind of parent you are and what kind of human you are, right? And um, like the example I can think of, it's still, man, it just, it's like so fucking resonates with me or not resonates, but it's so like it's seared into my memory, man. I'll never forget this as long as I've ever, I can give you 50 examples like this, but there was one. Um, when my son, Bishop, he's six, seven, six and a half now, when he was like three, um, he like, you know, dropped a glass or something and it broke. And like, I didn't think I yelled. At him. Like if you had stopped the record right there after I said, you know, I said, Bishop, what are you doing? Be careful. Like, and I basically said it like that. And I'm like, of course I'm not yelling at him. I'm just telling him, you know, like, hey, what? man, I'll never forget the look on his face, dude. Like, he looked like, it looked like I had stabbed him in the chest. Like, seriously. Like, and I'll, like, I'll never forget it, man, because it was like, a, it was like one of those moments. It's not like it was like, that's one of those moments where if you don't stop and really sit with what happened and how you feel about it, your life goes in a different direction. I had a choice to make at that moment. Was I going to see, forget what I thought I did. I could, I could rationalize it all day. He needs to learn this. He's got to toughen up, blah, 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 blah. I could have justified my uh, uh, actions in my own head. 
But the reality at three, he's not manipulating me. That's his real reaction. Whatever I think about what I did doesn't matter. What matters is that he's deeply wounded. His dad is mad at him and he doesn't know how to handle that. And that it like I had to face that. That I'm angry and that I snapped at my son in a way that wounded him, hurt him. And like unintentionally or not, right? For, doesn't matter. Irrelevant to a three-year-old. And so like I had to make a decision. And what, thank God, what I did, if I'm telling the story, because um, uh, I'm sure there's times I didn't handle it right. I'm not telling that story because I didn't you know it doesn't like say, I'm like, oh, I just rationalized it, push it out of my head. But that time I was like, oh, buddy, come, come, hold on, come here. And he like broke down in tears. And so, um, you know, uh, uh, I'm like, are, you know, are, what, are, you, are, you, are you okay? No. Yeah. I'm like, well, you're crying, buddy. You don't seem okay. Are you sad? Yeah. What are you sad about? I don't know. You know, because he's three, he doesn't know his emotion. And so I'm like, um, I'm like, are you sad because daddy yelled? Yeah. I'm like, and then we have a rule in our house. It's okay to make mistakes. You just have to uh, clean it up, say sorry and clean it up. Right? And I said, okay, well, daddy shouldn't yell at you. I'm sorry. Daddy made a mistake. You, you understand? Like you made, you, you made a mistake dropping the glass. Daddy made a mistake yelling. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, we, what's the rule? If you make a mistake, you say sorry and clean it up. Okay, I'm sorry, buddy. I'm sorry I yelled at you. And then he went, <gasps> and I, it's like I felt his whatever energy, his release. sadness, right, the release, <laughs> physically. And, I'm, dude, I'm not kidding, Jeremy, 20 or 30 seconds later, we were ba- he was bouncing around happy, and we were cleaning up the glass that he broke, and everything was fine. It was like, oh, dude. And so that was the, the, the flag in the ground where I had to, like, really understand that how mm. I show up to them is going to be mirrored back on me. And so it forces you to, 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 to look at yourself. And most people don't want to. I didn't want to. Um, mm. That's been the thing, the, the most challenging thing about having kids and the defining thing about having kids. And everyone knows there's amazing moments. There's terrible moments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't need to talk about that. That's the thing that's been paramount mm. for me in, in parenthood. Tucker, I want to be the first one to thank you. This has been amazing. I, I think in book titles in general, I don't know why, but like maybe your next book is just say sorry and clean it up or something, <laughs> you know, like a, a parenting book from an entrepreneur. Um, <clears throat> but, but thank you. Go to scribemedia.com. Check it out. Um, Tucker, thanks again. Of course, man. My pleasure. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. Like a beach if you find the sand right now I feel like a hundred grand